Hello, welcome to the Fulani Show. I'm Dr. Lenora Fulani. Joining me is my co-host, Dr. Fred Newman. Our guest today is Richard Rorty. Dr. Rorty is a distinguished American philosopher who teaches at the University of Virginia. He's the author of 11 books which have been translated into more than 15 languages. His two most recent books are Achieving Our Country, Leftist Thought in 20th Century America, and Truth and Progress, Philosophical Papers 3. They will both be published shortly. Fred and I were lucky enough to read them in manuscript, and we're eager to discuss them with Dr. Rorty in a special two-part interview today and next week. Welcome. Thanks very much. Glad nice to have to you have with us. Yeah. Um, in Achieving Our Country, um, it's a book in which you articulate a broad vision for the American left. As a progressive and an activist, I find it challenging and provocative. Uh, the book begins with the issue of national pride. You say we must be proud of our country if we want to improve it. What kind of pride are you talking about here? Um, just the ordinary old-fashioned kind <laughs> that said America was the first great constitutional democracy, uh, that we set a model for the French Revolution, that for at least a century the rest of the world thought of us as the place where all the promise of the Enlightenment was going to come to fruition. Uh, and even in the 20th century, um, the country that uh, helped conquer Hitler, uh, helped conquer Stalinism, uh, served as you know, a bastion of freedom, the usual mm -hmm. tributes to America. Much of the uh, contemporary American nef left never generated such a vision. Um, why is that, do you think? I think because of the heritage of the Vietnam War. Uh, that was the first war and really the first event, I think, in our national history that caused a large part of a generation to lose faith in the country, to decide that any country that killed a million Vietnamese for no purpose couldn't really be much good and must be some kind of fake. Mm -hmm. And I think this sense that uh, the country wasn't what it thought itself to be has persisted over the last 30 years, particularly in the colleges and the universities, some of the best of the 60s radicals became teachers. Some of them kept, the, kept a kind of anti-Americanism going in which the dominant image of the country was a racist, sexist, imperialist society basically corrupt to the core, needing total revolution, incapable of reform, and so on. I'm not sure anybody seriously believes that 60s story anymore, but it left its traces in, in the curriculum, in the way in which people taught, in the way in which some of the best leftist students <coughs> grew up in the last <coughs> couple of decades. Mm -hmm. Richard, you talk about, I don't know, about how and I agree with you that that's how the left responded, and that's that's been our heritage since that, since that. But do you think there was did anything did anything shift in the way American political leadership was doing things, which was somehow causally related to that, in your opinion? Or is it did did, did uh, whatever did the whole Vietnam thing get conducted differently than prior? Well, it, it was the closest we came to. Um, violence in the streets affecting national policy. I mean, it, I think it'll, it'll never be quite clear whether we eventually ended the war because the middle class wouldn't put up with college-educated white males running the danger of getting killed in the jungle, or whether because the kids were demonstrating in the streets. But probably, if it weren't for the demonstrations, the war wouldn't have, you mm -hmm. know. We didn't end very fast, but it probably would have ended even more slowly. So I'm inclined to think that, you know, we owe the 60s left for ending the war, or mm -hmm. at least ending it sooner. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, I think the 60s left broke the kind of consensus that the left had had and somehow managed, not because it wanted to, but indirectly, to shove the Democratic Party toward the center. Uh, and the sort of spectacular defeat of McGovern uh, right. made it very difficult for Democratic politicians to, you know, adopt, you know, fairly 
obvious positions like we got to get rid of J, J. Edgar Hoover and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And so the entire party uh, lost its left wing. Sure. And this, I think, has been disastrous for national politics. On the other hand, the 60s left, you know, when it took refuge in the colleges and the universities, managed to do a lot of good for the country because the the academy became a center for sort of all the aftershocks of the civil rights movement and it you know it provided a sanctuary uh, for you know, the women's movement gay rights um, you know it encouraged things like african-american studies you know that the academy created a, a sort of more civilized, decent version of America within its right. borders. On the other hand, it had less effect on national politics than it had had before the Vietnam War. Right. I guess I think just to pursue what I'm saying for a moment, what I'm raising, what I'd like what your opinion on, is do you think there was a shift in the conduct of America which produced some of those changes? Like was the Vietnam War conducted in any way very differently. No, I, th I, think, I think we just stumbled into the Vietnam War, the, uh -huh. way, nation, the way nations typically stumble into this kind of disaster. Uh -huh. And uh, it was up to the left to pull us out, and it did. Uh -huh. uh, and it was uh -huh. a great triumph. Uh -huh. uh, but I don't, you know, I don't think that America sort of swerved to the right at any point prior to the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. I think whatever swerving was a consequence of the 60s. Right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. One um, interesting chapter in your book discusses the role of the philosopher John Dewey and the poet Walt Whitman in creating the image of America. Um, you describe them as making a decision about what sort of nation we ought to be rather than merely describing how we are. What was their image and what's the process of a nation deciding what we are to become? Well, I think the intellectuals of a nation often play a role uh, in describing an ideal country and then this image of their this ideal sort of trickles down in the course of a couple generations and becomes part of socio-political common sense. I think John Stuart Mill did that for Britain in the middle of the last century. Uh, Bernard Shaw did it somewhat later. Uh, I think in America, Dewey and Whitman said, look, if we're going to be a democracy in the full-fledged sense of the term, uh, we've got to be a very different kind of nation than you know, any kind there's ever been before. Uh, we've got to think of ourselves in heroic terms. We've got to think of a country that gets along uh, without an appeal to God, without an appeal to tradition, uh, simply a country that has the courage to constantly experiment with itself. Uh, this is, I think, particularly true of Dewey. I mean, Dewey was sort of a boring when he went on and on about the experimental method, but I think the fundamental point was sound that in a democratic society, you don't have principles to abide by, you have social experiments to carry out, and you try to keep yourself experimenting as you know, often and as drastically as possible to see what, can, what the country can make itself into. So I think of Whitman and Dewey as saying that, you know, there can't be any judgment from above or outside on America. America is going to be autonomous and self-determining in a way that a country has never been autonomous before. Mm -hmm. And I think this was inspiring and inspired the left for a long time. <clears throat> mm -hmm. One of the things that you told me, which I'm very fascinated by, amongst, I, mean, I, I think we have some disagreements, but, I, but, I, but I'm fascinated by it, if I understand you correctly, is that you're saying that amongst the many problematic things that we got from Marxism. <laughs> if I, and it's a long listing that you give, an impressive listing. But one of them, if I understand what you were saying, is this notion that good things can only come from the bottom up. <laughs> that's, that's part mm -hmm. of the unfortunate heritage of a Marxist-dominated left, and, and that that skews. And so this relationship between what comes from the bottom up and what comes from the top down, as you were, is an issue that I've been fascinated with for a very long time. I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit. I think it's very interesting what you say. Well, I, th I think in most of the rich democracies in Europe and North America, social progress has been half top down and half bottom up, and the interaction between people with practically nothing revolting from below and, you know, 
rich, comfortable people on top having guilty consciences and changing things because of their guilty conscience. Uh, it's very hard to tell where one starts and the other leaves off. Uh, but I think that that's what social reform has typically amounted to in the democracies for the last hundred years or so. Uh, in the 60s, uh, you got the Marxist message that since everything up on top was hopeless or corrupt or something, uh, there was no hope for anything except from below. Uh, and this, you know, they had a good point to make in the 60s because the, you know, the only really good thing that had happened to America lately was the civil rights movement, which was from below. Mm -hmm. So the idea in the 60s was, you know, if the blacks can do it, maybe somehow society as a whole can do it or the oppressed as a whole can do it or something like that. Didn't pan out, but, you know, you can see why um, it looked like a good idea. And the only trouble with it was, I think, that it encouraged the idea that Passing laws, you know, waging reformist campaigns was bourgeois and weak and, you know, insufficiently radical, not really capable of dealing with the situation, mm -hmm. and so on. And if you weren't going to have a revolution, you had to be willing to settle for reform. But a lot of the years of the 60s just never were willing to settle for reform. Mm -hmm. Did it, do you think, that it, just kind of tying some things together, do you think that it at least panned out, again, to the extent that it was in some way or another transformative of the university? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think the universities you know, are just utterly different than they were before yeah. the 60s, and they're much better places. Uh, and they're, they're, as I said before, they're sort of the most civilized sectors of American right. life in all kinds of ways. Uh, the one way they're not particularly civilized is economically. Uh, the disparity of income among university employees is fantastic. Uh, every time the president announces a new budget, it turns out the faculty is going to get a 6% raise and every, everybody who isn't on the faculty will get maybe a 2% raise. So, you know, right. universities aren't that civilized. But still, uh, you know, they're the safest place in the country for homosexuals. Uh, they're a place where women have gotten, you know, a bigger and bigger role every decade for the last three decades. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's a lot to be said in their favor. On the other hand, uh, the right has been able to make fun of them by talking about political correctness and stuff like that. And the right has quite successfully managed to isolate the universities and, you know, say that, you know, they're so weird they can't possibly be a model for the rest of society. And it wasn't, I think it wasn't that way before the 60s. And the, the idea that the universities jolly well were a model for society mm -hmm. was more, you know, more prevalent then, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This issue of isolation um, is kind of interesting because one of my experiences in visiting universities is that even though people um, have politically correct organizations like gay organizations and black and uh, many others, um, there's not a lot of interaction between the young people in those organizations. In fact, if you put them all in a room together, they go to war. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was just wondering what you made of that. Um, well, I'm sort of dubious about what's come to be called identity politics mm -hmm. or the politics of recognition. I mean, you can see why this phrase came into existence because following the example of the black civil rights movement, everybody wanted to have their own movement, and, you know, why not? The trouble is that uh, it, as soon as you put things in terms of cultural identity, issues about class and money tend to get lost. And uh, that, you know, the, talking about the difference between the rich and the poor used to be what sort of held the left together in a you know, big, massive way. And you can't really get a left consisting of, you know, this culture plus that culture plus that culture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, money, but also what gets lost, and do you think, is America gets lost in all yeah. in, in the way that yeah. you're talking about. Yeah, the, the ideal of America is a classless society. I mean, it's, it's one thing to say, someday we'll have an America which isn't sexist, which isn't racist, which isn't homophobic. The trouble is we won't unless there's a lot of change in the economic sure. setup. Right. And uh, this somehow never comes up. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's as if 
the idea of an alliance between blacks, gays, women, and just you know plain ordinary straight white male workers was you know never crossed anybody's mind. Uh, didn't work out very well. <laughs> well, I don't I don't know that it didn't actually. I mean, uh -huh. you know, I mean, it seems to me that you know before the sixties. Movement for the end of racial discrimination and for um, you know justice in the workplace, you know, tended to go side by side. That is, the same people were identified with both. Uh, you know, the the politicians on the left who were on the side of the unions were also on the side of racial justice. Uh, you know, there wasn't any big tension. It was true. It was hard to get the white unionized workers to go along with the struggle against racism. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, the union leaders did their damnedest. Mm -hmm. uh, and now, you know, the unions are somewhere off in a different place than the academy, and their issues aren't yeah. the academy's issues. Yeah. And uh, the situation of the American workers is going to get worse and worse, I take it, because of globalization. So it seems to me the academic left had better start worrying about you know what happens to the white working class. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But what, all, all that you're describing was, in a sense, was pre-identity politics. And, yeah, that the, but before the '60s, nobody yeah. heard of identity politics. Right, exactly. You know, there were just two principal things wrong with the country: racial castes and economic classes. And you were supposed to be against both of them. And, you know, there's, no great difference between the struggle against the one and the struggle against the mm -hmm. other. As soon as the word culture entered the picture, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it wasn't just people causing other people, Americans causing other Americans unnecessary suffering. It was, you know, this culture versus some big thing called the hegemonic white straight male culture. And right. I, I just can't, can't get excited about that issue somehow. Mm -hmm. And I'm never really clear what the issue is. <laughs> mm -hmm. Let me, a little shift here, but maybe this is a, an unfair question, but all these things that we're talking about, um, what, if anything, do they, in your opinion, do they have to do with philosophy? Or philosophy with them? Not much. Not much. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, I, I don't, I mean, philosophy is a, just one academic specialty that occasionally, like other academic specialties, has an important trickle down effect. I, mm -hmm. you know, uh, soci American sociology had an important trickle-down effect at a certain period. You know, books about how the other half lives, what's going on in the slums, you know, uh, keeping track of black migration to the cities, you know, told us a lot of stuff we needed to know. And, you know, philosophy has occasionally trickled down, as in the influence of James and Dewey. Mm -hmm. There haven't been any particularly important American philosophers since Dewey's death. Mm -hmm. uh, Maybe there will be, but you know whether there are or not. I think isn't all that important. It's uh, because it isn't that you need to encourage one academic discipline over another academic discipline. If there's a social need, somebody in some academic discipline will come along and mm -hmm. try to serve it. And it might be in philosophy, might be in sociology, might be in political science. Mm -hmm. And how about pragmatism? Is that I mean, that's, pragmatism is both a term that's talked about as somehow intrinsically connected to the American spirit, to the American way of life, yeah. and it's a philosophical uh, conception. Uh, yeah. uh, but do those terms, two terms mean totally different things? Yeah, they do. Things? They do, really. I mean, in the common sense sense, pragmatism just means, you know, doing whatever it takes to get it done. Mm -hmm. And that's what people do anyway, so, you know, it's not a controversial thing. Uh, pragmatism in the technical philosophical sense usually means just a certain view about truth, namely, truth isn't, beliefs aren't true because they correspond to reality, beliefs are true because they help people get what they want. Uh, and that view of truth is connected with a whole series of other philosophical views uh, put forward by Nietzsche in Europe in the late 19th century, put forward by James and Dewey in America in the early 20th century. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, those issues, I think, just, you know, for 99% of social purposes, you don't have to know anything about them. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, in the long run, they can have an influence. The way the switch from you know, fundamentalist Christianity to liberal Christianity by the theologians had an influence in the course mm -hmm. of a few hundred years. Maybe the switch from 
rationalism to pragmatism among the philosophy professors will have some effect in the mm -hmm. course of 200 years, but it's not going to be anything sudden or dramatic. Mm -hmm. And you don't regard you don't regard that as problematic or as a, as a problem that this that philosophy is so distanced. I, I guess I'm wondering no. whether you think that's no. I I think that you know. Occasionally you get a philosopher genius like Nietzsche or William James whom people read and it makes a difference to the way they think. Like occasionally you get a, a theologian of genius like Niebuhr or Tillich and mm -hmm. people read them. And, mm -hmm. But it isn't that, you know, it isn't that you have to worry, you know, what's up with the theologians or what's up with the <laughs> philosophers. You know, you just wait for a good one to come down the pike. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I, I just, um, the title of your book, Achieving Our Country, was taken from a quote by James Baldwin. Yeah, his famous passage at the end of the fire next time. Yeah, it's very staring. And I mean, someone, I grew up on Baldwin, um, and one of the things I loved about him was his willingness to challenge um, a lot of institutional traditions. Um, I think especially in the black community also, which is unusual. Um, I was wondering where race and um, the unresolved conflict between blacks and whites fits into your notion of achieving our country. Like, how do you think about that? I, I think the um, the image that the left had in the first half of the century, or up to the 60s, was sooner or later the black-white problem will be solved the same way the immigration, the problem of European immigrants was solved at the beginning of the century. Uh, it'll, you know, everybody will just be thrown into a big melting pot. It didn't happen because the Wasps intermarried with the Italians, the Poles, the Jews, they didn't intermarry with the blacks. And as long as there isn't interracial intermarriage, we're going to have a race problem in the country, I think. You know, we'll, uh, the tradition of having a lower caste, which always comes out at the bottom, no matter who comes in on top of them, you know, Asian immigrants, you know, whoever the latest arrival is, is going to survive. And I don't, you know, I don't know how <laughs> you bring about intermarriage. I suppose one of the things I dislike about cultural politics is it makes it more, <laughs> more, more difficult rather than easier. But I haven't got any, any very bright ideas. I figure if, you know, if, if the suburban whites could make up their minds that they're going to have to be taxed so that you don't have horrors like the, the schools and the ghettos, you know, this is going to help, but it's not going to be any, you know, it's not going to cure the problem. Mm -hmm. Short of marriage, you have any thoughts? <laughs> no, I, 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 you know, I, know, I know it sounds silly, but, you know, <laughs> no, I, it's, uh, it's uh, I just don't see how, when a, when a caste system has endured for centuries, you break out of it, except by just you know eliminating the racial difference, uh, and uh, I, I don't see intermarriage becoming common in America. But if it doesn't become common, I don't know what happens. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. And creating a black middle class, as in the last few decades, has helped a lot. I mean, it changed the whites, the white middle class image just to know that it was conceivable that blacks could be members of the middle class. But that still, still leaves, you know, at least 50% of the blacks in America in a perfectly desperate situation. Probably more like 90. Okay, 90. Yeah, yeah. Something like that. One thing, is that, again, I know we're pursuing many different topics at the same time here, yes. but um, what, Going back to philosophy and as a, as a specialized uh, discipline, um, w in some respects, one could one could make a case, I suspect, for for the following: that lots of other departments, psychology departments, different different uh, the postmodernists in general, have in a way uh, been usurping philosophy. You know, now doing philosophy themselves is mm. is, 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 is is in some ways is. Is, is, is that a problem? No. Is that, uh, no. how, how do you view I, that? I, th I think that's actually encouraging. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's, I mean, the universities are much too broken down into distinct disciplines guarding their own turf. And, you know, the more breaks, the more breaks in the barriers between disciplines, the better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But a lot of professional philosophers, or not a lot, I don't know a lot, many I've spoken to are somewhat outraged by, by this. They have an attitude towards some of the 
the ways in which philosophy has been uh, uh, taken over and improperly applied, like this, the so-called, the whole issues of the so-called science wars with the postmodernism. Yeah. Is, is, I wonder what, if you have a, your thoughts well, about I, that. I think there are two different wars going on. There's the there are the so-called postmodernists in the literature departments versus the analytic philosophers in the philosophy departments. And that war, if you like, is just the philosophy department's fault. They refused to teach Nietzsche, Hegel, Heidegger, mm. Derrida, those people. Well, somebody was going to teach them, so the literature people began teaching right. them. I mean, you know, it, it just, there was a vacuum waiting to be filled. Uh, the science wars, I think, are different. Uh, the scientists got accustomed to being told that they were sort of a new priesthood. They were the people who were really in touch with true reality, and everybody else was, you know, in a kind of second-rate intellectual discipline. And they still insist on this kind of privilege. Right. So when somebody like Kuhn or Bruno Latour comes along and says, hey, science isn't all that different from all the rest of inquiry, they get outraged. But again, I, you know, I don't think it's much to worry about. It's just, mm -hmm. it's just an, you know, a priesthood afraid of losing its privileges. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to have you back next week. Maybe you could quickly announce the conference that you mentioned earlier. That you oh, yeah, I can get in a plug from my conference. Sure, sure. The, the University of Virginia, we're mm -hmm. having a conference called Does America Have a Democratic Mission? It's uh, 19th to the 21st of March in Charlottesville. The question is, uh, does the country have a sense of itself that gives being an American citizen a moral force. I mean, can Americans still feel that to be an American is to have a moral identity? <laughs> so we got a lot of people coming to talk about this. Uh, Daniel Bell, who's sort of the dean of American right. social and cultural critics. Sean Willance, American historian. Uh, a lot of people from abroad, Gayatri Spivak, who comes from India. Uh, Anthony Appiah is sort of half Ghanese, half English, uh, Akira. Oh, we just ran out of time, Sorry. but <laughs> all of us are invited. Yeah. <laughs> so come to uh, come to Virginia. Yeah. Um, looks like we're out of time, but Dr. Rorty will be back with us next week to continue the discussion. Thanks for joining us this week. We love to get your comments and questions. You can reach me by calling the telephone number on your screen, or you can visit us online. Our website is www.fulani.org. This is Lenore Fulani saying, "Take care of yourself. I'll see you next week." March proudly and strongly and bring to the people of New